Hey, I'm with uh, John Stahlberg Jr., director of Muzzle. We, we were actually just talking about your film uh, on Friday, um, and kind of in in relation of dog films versus cat films. But uh, we can oh. get into that in a moment. Um, yeah, what tell, is it? Tell me about cat? Muzzle. Oh, oh I was ahead. just wondering why I'm not. I couldn't recall. I'm a cinephile, and I can't really recall that many cat films. Yeah, I guess there I mean, are. We, some, like, we were talking about horror movies. Most cat films cat. are are documentaries. They tend to be documentaries and not not dramatics. Yeah, um, yeah like the Maisel's you know, like brothers. That darn cat. Yeah, <laughs> or the robot cats for some reason. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, you go sci-fi with it. Um, All right. So, well, cool. so tell, well, tell us about Muzzle. Uh, Muzzle's a, a you know it's a quaint story about a boy and his dog. Um, it's just in the worst possible way. It's uh, a story about a police officer, canine police officer played by Aaron Eckhart uh, and his partner played by an animal, played by a dog. That sort of first one uh, tragically um, dies in the line of duty and he has to sort of react to that and he kind of can't let it go. And he's a kind of a, a damaged character uh, and has to connect with this uh, another damaged character who's played by another dog and uh it's his new partner and he has to kind of figure out a path forward so to speak. yeah you so just uh the first thing that caught me was this is not turner and hooch uh no, no it's a very not. dark and gritty uh, how how did the story come about and you know how did how did the story what was what's the origins of stories and and then how did you decide on the tone you wanted to take with it well the tone is just is just sort of your voice, right? It's sort of like the way you look at the world. I, I tend to look at the world in a very like cynical, misanthropic way. I just, that's just my personality. Um, the writer, Carlisle Eubank, has a similar kind of personality in terms of just looking at things in a, in a cynical way. I mean, we're both optimistic people. I consider myself almost like an optimistic nihilist, but I was driving by uh, a canine officer on the highway and he was having this like intense conversation. I don't know if he's on the radio or talking on the phone or whatever. And as we came alongside of him, it was a moody, dark night, rainy in New York. We had just wrapped the film Crypto that Carlisle wrote. And we passed him. It, we sort of, it was almost like a camera shot. It tracked past him and revealed there was a dog in the passenger seat that he was talking to. And the whole movie sort of arose from that. And I don't know if the mood of that night and having just finished a, a very difficult shoot in New York um, sort of, you know, uh, informed the tone, but again, like we started talking about, um, dogs and he raises German shepherds and he and I are both just those sort of people that like to kind of, um, commit the crime of noticing. We like to call it, you know, um, let's set it in a real LA. It's my hometown. Um, let's not set it in this like movie LA. Let's set it in like the way it really is. And like, that may be a little bit, upsetting for some people i know that like some people get really oh that's just terrible he's this is a fever dream of something i'm like bro this is i was born in hollywood this is my hometown like this is this is the way it is so this is not a um in fact i read some review i do read the reviews and someone ridiculous reviewer was like uh this is the fakest police station there's graffiti and homeless people that was a real police station this isn't like a $50 million movie where we have background actors playing all the homeless. There's like real homeless people. Like we're just filming real people. We, me and my cinematographer, Peter Vermeer have a camera in the car. We stop on the street and I'm like, quick, get out, shoot the station. And he just like films it for a little bit. And then I'm like, quick, there's people coming, like get in the car and no permits. And we just drive off. And then you have this reviewer imagining that it's like a hundred million dollar movie. We have the craft service budget of most movies. And then they yeah. say like, oh, this feels contrived. I'm like, that's real. <laughs> so it's f funny for me. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in LA as well. And yeah, it's uh, it's definitely LA. <laughs> yeah. Where did, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up, actually, I was born uh, in Culver City and then hmm. moved down toward Torrance. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on the south end of, of LA. Yeah. I mean, it's not far. I grew up, I ended up getting like raised on the west side. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, so we, we knew it. We knew it back then. I mean, it was like the west side of LA, like that was always notoriously like a lot of homeless people santa monica kind of like pushed them all out into venice in like south la right around culver city like go drive in the underpass of venice and sepulveda mm -hmm. go drive in it's not even homeless encampments it's like favelas they're like full structures 
drug dealers on the little bikes that they got stolen from kids. All my kids' bikes get stolen. I see the drug dealers riding on these little kids' bikes. And it's like, you know, and then you talk to the cops and you're like, man, my kids' bikes just got stolen. And they go, oh, we'll check the homeless camps for the drug dealer bikes. It's like, what, what is going on here? Anyway, yeah. so set a movie about a Turner and Hooch in that world, <laughs> you know, and then yeah, that's kind of an interesting movie to me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's that lighter tone that's always been, you know, the Hollywood film. And, and that's what I liked about this one was that that darker tone. And and I'm curious. So you had the idea of let's let's make a canine cop movie. Um, what were the challenges in in uh, starting the project? Uh, you know, because you're working with a dog, not only a dog, but you know, a, a police dog. Um, what were the challenges like? And and then what was the actual process of, of working with the dog uh, for the film? Well, the challenges of working with a dog are immense it's it's one of the cardinal rules of filmmaking right be careful working with animals cats or dogs um i've worked with cats too in commercials it's like i one time had a cat djing it was like impossible we, and and you you realize in high school the film i had that went to sundance adrian brody's character has a little dog that had to scratch we had four pomeranians one could bark one could scratch and like two backup scratching dogs like that's what you have to do so we have multiple dogs in this movie uh, each one could do different things. One could was a little bit sillier, could do more of the cuddly, wouldn't eat stuff that was Lego, long hair Belgian Malinois. And another long hair Belgian Malinois named Jagger was like the more vicious one, could chomp. And these Belgian Malinois are known by the military and police law enforcement uh, who work with them as fur missiles. They're like these, they're like these almost like those uh, Boston Dynamics robotic dogs. Like they're like machines. They can like fly through the air. It's, it's crazy. And they're so incredibly powerful. And they're not inherently dangerous animals. They're very sweet. They're working dogs. However, they're trained to kill people. Or, you know, they're trained to bite people. They're not, they don't want to do it. So they go through this rigorous process and they train them to bite people. So you don't want to get too close to these animals. These animals are like, extremely dangerous when we're working with real police uh handlers and canine officers which we had a ton of them we were working in the real canine kennels and working with all the, all the real officers of those guys training you see all the real police dogs when we're filming that it was definitely scary a little scary we have all these police dogs running around you and uh, you know, every once in a while, they get interested in you and they start to, and the guy will go, uh, uh, it, and speak in German to them. He's like, that's Sitzen, you know, seats height, height, that's height. And I'm like talking to these guys, like, are you speaking German to your, you know? And and then that whole part got revealed and it, it just kept getting more and more interesting as, as we went deeper into the movie. Yeah. I, uh, I know why they speak German because my, my brother was trying to raise a, uh, a rescue dog. And they say you got to train them in a different language so that they don't get get confused by someone you know trying to yell out a command and, and go take your dog. And so that's he true. chose Klingon to to train his dog. Oh, that's really smart. Except Spock, you couldn't you couldn't catch him, or um, uh, you know Leonard Nimoy back in the day. Um, you uh, what happens in Germany though? <laughs> like, well, I mean, the the issue was that you had to do it in a different language other than English. I wonder what so they mean. Yeah, because. Um, because uh yeah if, if you're if the dog if you're if the dog's in a uh situation yeah um and you know the perpetrator yells out a command like uh like stop sit stop. or something like that so, right, the, right then the dog wouldn't respond to that right you know the issue no the dog's um, incredibly well trained it's it's unbelievable yeah. yeah i mean was that uh was that relatively easy to pull together or i because no. we, we do a lot of uh we have a lot of indie filmmakers watching this and so you know, no, that, that's incredibly difficult, <laughs> Alan. That's <laughs> I, I don't recommend trying to do animal movies on a 20 day schedule. Like this was insane that we decided to do this um, with not a ton of support. There was nobody like supporting us. It was like mm -hmm. me, my cinematographer and, you know, someone just saying no from some office somewhere all the time. <laughs> oh, you can't do that. No, no, this, no, that. And we would just like go out on a Saturday and I'd call up the police officers and they would meet us at the training facility. And it was just me, my DP, my AC and and like these dogs. And we would just do all this stuff. So, no, it's incredibly difficult. It was very hard to find a very good animal trainer. We found one in this guy, David Alsberry. He came with his full team, which was kind of like the last minute. It was like. I think it was like four weeks before shooting. 
I'd spoken to this woman who was the daughter of one of the most famous animal trainers in the history of Hollywood, had done all these you know, famous movies. Um, and she did a film called White God. It was a Hungarian film that played at Sundance in like 2011 or 14 or something. Anyway, about all these dogs running wild. It's like amazing film, right? It's this incredible movie. And I called her and I was like, okay. And she was like, all right, I'm in. How much time do we have? Like six months, nine months? I'm like, four weeks. And she was like, <laughs> I am so sorry. She's like, that is like borderline malpractice. Like we can't. And then I called David. He was like, yeah, man, we can do it. And so <laughs> he came out with his team and and he did it. He trained these animals and everything. And it was it was hard. You know, you try to create a yeah. connection with the actor. Aaron's like, oh, I want to get to know this dog. And the dog like almost bit his face off. Oh. And we, we ended up like putting in the movie. But the dog almost bit his face off. And, um, and so we said, okay. Uh, the trainer said, well, John, we want to pitch you something. We're going to bring Lego in to do this scene. I'm like, yeah, but we're establishing the dog. And Lego was supposed to be the dog that was going to be like in the back. Like we use him for wide shots. But this one was much more of like a handsome looking. You can't tell them apart. Mm -hmm. But me, when I was working, I was like, this one is like more cinematic looking. But it almost bit your actor's face off. So we have to switch to the like slightly goofy looking dog who's very sweet. And uh, and then so that became the establishing of the character. There's your cat, man. I know. He's just here's just talking about dogs and he's like, man, get in on this. So <laughs> the, the, um, so Lego became socks in a way. Anyway, it's like this really kind of organic thing. Working with animals is tricky. You have to roll with it. You have to silo off coverage for filmmakers, indie filmmakers mm -hmm. listening. When you're shooting a scene, you have to shoot it, like establish the dog, shoot your actors, and then like wrap the actors and like then work on the dog and get the dog stuff, what you need to do. It's like we just kept calling it siloed coverage. We would just mm -hmm. like put the dog coverage in a silo and do that separate, uh, even if so, it required a second unit. So let me ask you this question. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about working with dogs. What What is that piece of advice you would give to filmmakers who, who are thinking about, hey, I want to make a movie with with dogs in it, especially the kind of the canine. I would say. Realm. I would say try to work on who your dog trainer is at the very, very beginning of the process. I had hammered that to these nudniks I was working with, these absolute fools. And I said, like, guys, we need to get the trainer. We need to get the trainer. We need to get the trainer. And they were like, oh, he's just he's just freaking out. It's like, no, like we need. So you need to do that early because the point is, let's say you have something really simple. You're like, oh, it's really simple. I just need the dog to like go over to the food bowl and not eat the food. They're like, that's six weeks. You're like, what? You're like, yeah, we have to train him that the food in the bowl is like not, is, is terrible tasting. Then you have to do the thing. And then he, you know, it, it's like everything. The end of the, well, I don't want to blow the end of the movie, but the end of the movie, you see the dog a certain way, mm -hmm. right? I'm just kind of blowing it, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, the point is. It's a cop movie. We know, we know. It's a cop it. movie. The, <laughs> that took, that took six weeks. Like that was, very difficult and um these things that seem simple oh we just want the dog to go into his cage come on just get the dog to go into his cage well there's like 50 people standing around and the dog is like looking at all of them and you can't just go up to the dog and be like hey look buddy what we want here is just for you to walk into this it's like he's a dog you can't say like that was good but this take can you try it a little it's like no you have to have been drilling that into him for six weeks can you do it slower uh, can you emote you can't no there's <laughs> yeah. no directing the dog that that happens and he scratches the ear you know after a good take but like you know but you do that to the actors too though you just kind of yeah. go hey good take aaron okay amazing um yeah and then was it relatively easy then to get like aaron had uh you've done a few movies before so i assume there's kind of uh it was casting easy maybe i'll just start with that no, I mean, casting it, uh, I thought Aaron would be good for the role. Um, he's a great actor. I've never seen him bring in a bad performance, even in a movie that I didn't necessarily love that he was a part of. I, I've never disliked what he did or called bullshit on what he did. I always thought it was, it always feels very real. And that was kind of the the tone of the film. I wanted to make it like this kind of gritty, almost like it, it becomes a little surreal, but it's like this kind of cinematic realism. Like I wanted it to feel kind of grimy and almost like, mistakes like just i never shoot handheld but i shot this whole movie handheld uh almost a whole movie 
my last film, the next film that I have coming out, Bad Hombres, comes out November 17th. And there's not one handheld shot in the whole movie. There wasn't one handheld shot in crypto. Oh, there's one scene in crypto. But this, I wanted a real vibe. So Aaron was a guy who always seems kind of real. I mean, I've seen all of his movies. Um, there's something just really kind of believable about him. Um, and seems like off the cuff, like organic, even though he's like a very um, preparation oriented actor. He memorizes the script a year in advance. I mean, it's like, it's very, it's amazing, actually. He can knock off like a whole monologue of a scene that we're not shooting for a week and a half. And he's like, oh, you mean that scene where I say, and he'll just do it. And I'm like, wow, that's, he's like, got it. And he goes, oh, I memorized this stuff well before I show up. And so, um, so he's great. We sent it to him and uh, he engaged. It was like that. I mean, we just shoot it to him with an offer. And he said he'd love to get on the phone. We did. And uh, I guess we vibed, you know, uh, we, I had a great relationship working with him. Just, it was, it was interesting because I know certain actors can be, oh, he's difficult or he's tricky or this and that, this and that. I, I think when it, it's all about the chemistry between people. And if there's chemistry, you know it, like we have chemistry, Alan, you know, we're both LA boys. And so like, you just kind of click with somebody and then, it's just it just works and so it was it was totally cool working with him amazing all right well i appreciate you uh spend a few minutes talking to us um so, much. so muzzle is in theaters and vod is that right yeah it's uh it's in i think 26 theaters or slightly under 30 theaters across the country um i don't know if it'll be playing after thursday um but we'll see it's there's packed theaters that we've been hearing across the country and it's number five on apple tv above indiana jones so it's like being written up in all these articles today that it's i mean it was like the little engine that could that's a 300 yeah. million dollar movie with a hundred million dollar marketing budget and our movies above above them and it's like a movie i grew up like indiana jones oh, yeah. so it's like people are are popping champagne so yeah we're we're happy the audiences like it well, let's just say a lot of movies are beating Indiana Jones right now, but know, but, but for an indie many, film to do it, five. that's amazing. Yeah, Absolutely. on the on the premium VOD, so so it's a day and date release, so it's a P VOD. So you have like Barbie, uh, you know, like whatever that Jennifer Lawrence sex comedy, you know, Blue Beetle, and then you have like Muzzle, and then Indiana Jones, and then Spider Man. Like we're above Spider Man and Indiana <laughs> Jones, so so it's doing really well. So it's available on. Uh, Apple TV, Amazon, and everything has a premium VOD title, and you can go see it in the theater if it's playing near you. It's a good theater experience. Absolutely. Okay. Well, everyone go see Muzzle, and thank you, John, for uh, for talking with us today. I appreciate the time, Alan. Thanks a lot.